458. All right. So let us start the session by chanting our Tasa. Namo Tasa Bhagavatu Arahatu Samma Sambundasa. Namo Tasa Bhagavatu Arahatu Samma Sambundasa. Namo tasse bhagavatu arahatu samma sambuddhasu. Page number 258. All right. Verse 29, summary. Right. Thus, in the three cases of the sensuous world, the fine material world, and non-percipient beings. The occurrence of material phenomena should be understood as twofold by way of rebirth linking and the cause of existence by way of rebirth linking and the cause of existence. In the sense planes, 28 material phenomena are found. In the fine material planes, 23. Among the non percipients, 17. But none in the immaterial plane. At the moment of conception, sound, mutability, decay and death are not found. In the cause of existence, there is nothing that is not obtained. Herein, this is the procedure regarding the occurrence of material phenomena, right? Now these we discussed at the last class with regards to the sense beings, the immaterial, the sense sphere, uh, the immaterial and the non-percipient beings, right? Non-percipient beings. Are there any questions that anyone would like to ask regarding what we discussed not in the previous class? All right, so Nibbana. Definition. Nibbana is termed supramundane, and it is to be realized by the knowledge of the four parts. Knowledge of the four parts. It becomes an object to the parts and fruit. It becomes an object to the parts and the fruits meaning the Magga and Palachittas take Nibbana as object, right? Take Nibbana as object. It is called Nibbana because it is a departure from craving, which is entanglement which is entanglement. So within the course of life of a being, he or the person would attain to Nibbana four times, right? Attain to Nibbana four times. Sotapanna, Sakuddhagami, Anagami, and Arahat, right? And Arahat. The experiences are different. Arahantship 
being the most supreme out of the rest, right? Being the most supreme out of the rest. And the only chittas, as we already know, which can take Nibbana as object are, is only Magga and Pala. Is only Magga and Pala. Guide to verse 30. Nibbana is termed Supramande. The concluding section of this chapter deals briefly with the four ultimate, deals briefly with the fourth ultimate reality, Nibbana. Etymologically, the word Nibbana, the Pali form of the better known Sanskrit Nirvana, is derived from the verb Nibbati. Right, is derived from the verb nibbati, meaning to be blown out or to be extinguished. It thus signifies the extinguishing of the worldly fires of greed, of the worldly fires of greed, right? Hatred and delusion. But the Pali commentary prefers to treat it as a negation of or departure from nikantakta, the entanglement, vana, of craving. The derivation which is offered here. For as long as one is entangled by craving, one remains bound in samsara. The cycle of birth and death, samsara, the cycle of birth and death. But when all craving has been extirpated, one attains nibbana, deliverance from the cycle of birth and death. One defining moment in the experience of Nibbana, we know, which was explained in the Chitta Vita chapter, is this sort of word which is used to define the Manodwara Vajana process or the Yonsumansakara or Ayonsumansakara position of the Viti. Earlier, when we refer to the Vottapana, the Vottapana symbolifies an object or type, in, type of object, a essence, not a type of object, an essence which the mind predominantly craves for, craves for in its process of being and continuation, meaning the consciousness takes pleasure, if I put it in this manner, takes pleasure in an essence. Earlier, the essence was bound by hate, uh, greed, hatred, and delusion. As we go into the higher realms of the supramundane attainments, now the consciousness having first derived its pleasure or based its cognitive processes on the attributes of greed, hatred, and delusion, now base its being upon other essences. Essences that the mind earlier did not use or base itself on. Hence, we have the word of Gotrabu, meaning now these, this class, this class of mind does not use the same structures for support. Right? It is because the mind earlier used those same structures of support 
for the continuation of the mind. That being the reason of why that mind was not able to take Nibbana as object. Do you understand? Now, when the mind bases itself on this new class, which was never experienced by a person who had not attained to the mug and the pala before, this new class has a new sense of essence that it bases its cognitive processes upon. Right? Through do nibbana is one-fold according to its intrinsic nature, though Nibbana is one-fold according to its intrinsic nature, by reference to basis for distinction, it is two-fold. Namely, the element of Nibbana with the residue remaining. What is the residue remaining? The mind and the body, right? And the element of Nibbana without the residue remaining. It is threefold according to its different aspects, namely void, signless, and desireless. Void, signless, and desireless. Guide to verse 31. Though Nibbana is onefold according to its instinctive nature, etc. Nibbana is a single, undifferentiated, ultimate reality. It is exclusively supramundane. It is never mundane. And has one intrinsic nature. Now, when we refer to, even if we take the Pali word, lokotara, loka, uttara, lokotara, supramundane, that which goes beyond the mundane or rather surpasses the mundane, right? Again, coming down to, again, coming down to the fact of the base of support that Nibbana or that consciousness which has now attained or seen or experienced Nibbana now the base that it uses, which is not mundane. In the mundane world, just like the Jeevita Indriya process of physicality or the Jeevita Indriya process of consciousness, its main duty remains, and it's, and it's um, um, the word to use here would be its, its, There's a word which begins with C. Hmm. It's, if I, I can't remember the C word, but its behavior is to continue. For example, Jeevita Indriya as physicality or Jeevita Indriya as mentality, both has the essence, the characteristic of continuity, right? The C word that I was thinking of was not characteristic, by the way. <laughs> That's, I'm even thinking of another C word. It's not coming to my mind at the moment. Regardless, the characteristic of it that is continuity. Now, when the Jeeviti Indriya, or if you are speaking about that essence with regards to a person who has now attained, the characteristic is only to live in that moment without the delusionary thought of this moment prolonging into the future. Because attachment would appear within an object that would arise at this moment through the five senses or the data that we would comprehend with regards to the past or the future in the present. Right? In the present. So, it is exclusively supramundane and has no intrinsic nature, which is that of being, which is that of being the unconditioned, deathless element totally transcendent to the conditioned world. Totally transcendent 
from the conditioned world. Nevertheless, by reference to a basis for distinction, Nibbana is said to be twofold. The base for distinction is a presence or absence of the five aggregates. Saupadi sesa and Anupadi sesa nirvana, right? Nibbana with the body and the mind and Nibbana with that whole sense of voidness, right? The element of Nibbana as experienced by Arahant is called with the residue remaining, Saupadi sesa. Because though the defilements have been extinguished, the residue of aggregates acquired by past clinging remains through the duration of the Arahant's life. The element of Nibbana attained with the Arahant's demise is called that without the residue remaining, Anupadi says. Because the five aggregates are discarded and are never acquired again. The two elements of Nibbana are also called in the commentaries the extinguishment of defilement, kilesa pari nirbhana, and the extinguishment of aggregates, come the pari nirbhana, pari nibbana. It is threefold according to its different aspects. Nibbana is called the void because it is devoid of greed, hatred, and delusion, and because it is devoid of all that is conditioned. It is called sen signless, animitta, because it is free from the signs of greed, etc., and free from the signs of all conditioned things. It is called desireless, because it is free from the hankering of greed, etc., and because it is not desired by craving. Now here, if we come to, it is called signless, animitta, because it is free from the signs of greed. This all relates to the experience of a human and how we would take an object as a sign of greed, hatred, and delusion, we should then impinge upon that specific prapancha or that specific attribute or hindrance rather to arise at that point respectively, right? An object, whether it be physicality or mentality, mind or body, now it being signless because why? Unconditioned. Right, unconditioned. When it is unconditioned, it means that then the being who is now cognizing or working with the present moment or living within the present moment rather, is doing so based entirely upon the present, but not conditioned by the signs of greed, hatred, delusion, or any other definition by which we relate to the hindrances, right? To the hindrances. Great seers who are free from craving declare the Nibbana is an objective state which is deathless, absolutely endless, unconditioned and unsurpassed. Thus, as fourfold, the Tathagatas reveal the ultimate realities, consciousness, mental factors, matter, and Nibbana. Thus ends the sixth chapter in the manual of Abhidhamma entitled The Compendium of Matter. <laughs> right. Any questions? Mante. Yes, Mante. When you, when I listen to your explanation on the Nirvana, this remind me of a, a scientific conditions created by scientists called singularity. The singularity is a condition where there is no, uh, there's no 
physical laws influencing that and there's no time and there's no space mm. right so it's a, a if i say it's a, a single point existence right it's very 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 similar to the uh, the information or the the discussions you gave us actually so if that is the it, actually singularity is there it's it's the conditions we are uh, in the universe we had before big bang mm. big bang created the three dimensional four dimensional world with time and space and before that this condition is yeah, they explain this is the condition before the the big bang so it's a this is this is very close similarity because when you say uh, conditionless it's in science it's explained as actually no physical uh, laws that exist in this four dimensional world influence that uh, conditions that means there's no gravity there's no uh, force there's no energy there's nothing there mm -hmm. so uh, supramundane by itself is above the universe well when we take professor newman's uh, or rather newman's theory of singularity yeah. It's a hypothetical point of time where it it denotes a position yes. where now human civilization and technologies can never go back. Yes. Almost as if Albert Einstein's uh, discover, uh, discoveries or invention. So the, the notion of the Big Bang or something like that. In that sense, yes. It does have a similarity to sing the, the theory of Newman's theory of singularity because the, the experience of Nibbana uh, is, is in itself a discovery of being, um, of being almost as profound as coming into the insightful understanding that one does not have to cling to live, which I think it's isn't that what all of us are trying to actually experience at this moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we talk about it again. Yeah. And, uh, yes, Damsiri, it does have a, a very, very close, I think, I mean, by, by theory of yeah. singularity, I think, yes, when you attain yeah. Ramana in one of the four degrees of how you could attain it, you don't go back. You are a change person forever. And that insight is, is, is further personified in a way where you see or you are now revealed a way of sight or foresight rather into this being and through which the external world and universe which we saw in a different manner earlier. So yes, I think, yes, of course, it does have, if you go by the definition of singularity, yes, it does. Because at this point, human singularity would say human civilization and technologies will not be able to return back after that point. And in the same manner, we will not be able to return after that point. You know, almost as if when uh, with the discovery of fire, by the hunter-gatherers, the ancient, ancient hunter-gatherers of the past, their lives never return to being the same. So yes, I think so as well. Yeah, thank you, Damsari, for bringing that to light. Um, any, any, anyone else would like to say something or? Dante, uh, can I please ask? Yes. Uh, yes. Um, you said, um, you know, when you achieve Nibbana, you said there are four state, four four times when it happens. But is it eight times? Is it like, does it have to be the 
mug and the parlor or is it just mug as well would you yes, say you have full it is through full processors we see parlor if we say in detail it's eight times okay thank you but eight times so then when we say eight times we are specifically not referring to the process but eight times the consciousness takes nibbana as object that's what i meant yes thank you thank you yes anyone else yes sujata i'm not very clever in this subject but i can just ask a question a very uh, sort of um, wondering it is uh, you we came across that uh, phrase there where i say where you say nibbana is twofold that's uh, could you clarify or explain a bit about that please bante well, nibbana is twofold just for the sake of differentiation just for the sake of differentiation which which points to a time when the nib or differentiation when it points to a time where the person who has attained nibbana has is still bound by the attributes that or aggregates rather of the mind and the body right and then to a position where we would say the person has attained to full enlightenment mm -hmm. now it is not a place of being but it only relates to the fact that the person has attained to the state of nibbana and nibbana is a state of voidness right voidness yes voidness yeah. right yes. and the full attainment to that voidness is yeah. as literally as it is being void which is actually not that attractive when we no. word void <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i think that is the problem itself i think with all of us isn't it because the ingraining the ingrained idea which makes or the ingrained condition that makes voidness unattractive is the main problem itself mm. yeah it is but when i got that when the term twofold came it uh, yeah. gave me a bit of thoughts what are the thoughts share your uh, thoughts yes yes thoughts are absolutely what it was because nibbana is a nothingness they say mm. uh, you see that is and there's a void you said so now that's what i wondering how okay. okay so here it's talking about a person who lives attaining nibbana and a person who has now passed having attained nibbana mm. right the person who lives having attained nibbana is still living with those conditions that the person has accumulated uh, through karma and through rebirth but the person who dies or passes having attained nibbana has none of those bounds or is not bounded or conditioned by those by by that past of karma and rebirth okay then i'm trying to think a little more at the moment i'm going to stop so, bante no, because no, no. i yeah. so yes you easily understand sariputta yeah yeah uh, during his time of life after attaining nibbana right yes. is the person who lives having yes. a nibbana mm -hmm. right sariputta when he dies when he passed right when he attained parinirvana yes. this is the moment where he now the person the this this being becomes fully no more Right. Okay. Breaking the cycle of rebirth and death, and now ending samsara for himself. Right. Because, I think I'm getting a little bit of it, Bhante. I'm not that clever. I told you the subject is vast too much for me. <laughs> I never ever studied before. I'm just listening. Thank you very much, Bhante. All right, Sujata. In something yes. only. Thank you, Bhante. Can I ask something, Bhante? Yes, Yani. 
Um, so that means that a person who is passing away, who have attained uh, Parinirvana, is uh, at the dying moment, this person is, the mind is in a very meditative state. So therefore they have no, uh, um, um, re uh, rebirth linking uh, yeah. chances. So, so the mind of, let's say now, to explain Dashyani or to rather understand that, we must understand the difference between a person who is a jhana attained person and a person mm -hmm. who is, I'm sorry, just a jhana attained person and a person mm -hmm. who is attained in bhana. Mm -hmm. Now, a jhana attained person would have to go into his attainment, mm -hmm. his mm -hmm. to, to yeah. reap the fruits of his attainment. Yes. But with Nibbana, the fruits of the attainment, of course, the purest form is when he attains to the Magga, um, uh, the, ma the Palasama, Palasama Pati, right? Mm -hmm. However, the conditions that now the mind works by has completely gone through a metamorphical transference process, mm -hmm. right? So earlier, now, the jhana attained person can always fall away from the jhana when the differences arise. Mm -hmm. The nibbana, the person who has obtained nibbana, does not have the, if I am to use this word, the wiring. Mm -hmm. The wiring mm -hmm. required mm -hmm. for the hindrance to us to arise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He is now mentally incapable of harboring, supporting the hindrances. Mm -hmm. He is mentally incapable mm -hmm. of doing anything supported by prapanchas, nivarana, and mm -hmm. anything which is unwholesome. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Unwholesome. That aspect of being conditioned is taken away by the attainment itself of arahanthood. Right, okay. Now, I have another question. Now, if you are in a, if you're a, a, a meditation, med, a person who's practicing meditation, who can go into jhana, and, and you are in a, a situation where you have to go through an operation, you are on the table and you focus your mind totally into a one pointedness and you're in a jhana and you expect, you tell the doctor, I want to take my um, anesthesia, anesthetic treatment and right this moment. So they plan together so that medication is gradually entering into your body, taking into your deep sleep. And also your mind is one position at that moment with the both meet together. What is that person's state of mind at that moment in time? If the person dies at that moment in time, something happens and, you know, um, um, uh, going to um, uh, cardiac arrest or something and dies. What is that person's state of mind then? Dependent on the person's attainment, if the person has attained or has jhana, right? Mm -hmm. Depending on whatever attainment the person has, he will have a corresponding rebirth. Right? He will have a corresponding rebirth. Now, even even with persons, we actually, I know of monks who I have personally known, who have had sort of um, operations done on them without mm -hmm. anesthetic, just because they wanted to put their uh, sort of uh, practice, um, their sort of practice into practice, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. And 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 um, and it all depends, Shriani, on the state or rather the attainment that the person has. However, now let's say the jhana was not a pranita jhana; it was a madhyama or a hina jhana. 
right mm-hmm. D- during the moment during that specific moment if it is an operation and if there's pain and if aversion arises with regards mm-hmm. to the pain uh, the jhana can there is a chance that the jhana can actually you can lose a jhana because of the aversion that could potentially arise but if the jhana has you have seasoned the jhana as a practitioner then there is a possibility and she uh, has the possibility i'm sorry uh, seasoned jhana there is a possibility that of course you can go through it without uh, compromising the jhana so it really depends on the state of mind really right it really depends on the state of mind it is very difficult for us to sort of say okay this might be it because even if the person had jhana before he could lose it or the person can very well not lose it and really be in samadhi as well mm 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 right yeah mm mm-hmm. because i because i experienced a friend who had gone into samadhi states while uh, she was going through an operation and she said it's so peaceful and it um uh, uh, it went so uh, went into like sort of um, um sleep mm. through uh, the um the the book happened together i can't explain to you how she she explained it to me very beautifully how it happens and when she suddenly woke up it was like nothing happened you know so um, um it's difficult it is difficult to explain to i don't know she did beautifully explain to me this uh, the person who is a meditation practitioner who's gone through an operation who explained to me this yeah, yeah, yeah. but i was think if that person had died in, during that time where would be the birth whether there would be a rebirth depending depending on there if the person has not attained nibbana or as a arahant there would be of course rebirth Mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. that would be mm-hmm. but there are some past mm-hmm. practitioners there are some past mm-hmm. practitioners who have or who use um you know these medical sort of situations as mm-hmm. to to sort of focus and go into um go into jhanic states um jhanic states also powerful practitioners there are stories of powerful practitioners where they might have not attained to jhana or certain high states but at the moment or then really sort of having been a practitioner you can't just do it you know out of out of just the sheer need now arising okay. at your last moment but being a practitioner during the last moments okay. when you know that you're going to lose in the sense lose your life or what not uh there have been practitioners who go into states of samadhi deep states of samadhi right by the mere fact of accepting death right mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fact of accepting death um i told you of this story uh, i told you of this story of this australian monk uh, who who went to jaffna right mm-hmm. now he explains his experience of going into samadhi very deep states of samadhi um you know while sort of here in the shooting behind uh, between the military and the terrorist groups right knowing that there is a possibility and sort of giving up giving up on the hope of life or living rather that letting go aspect has a very profound result over the meditative experience that one has because of that powerful letting go mm-hmm. right so we can't say whether the person now completely attains nibbana without actually knowing whether the person has a tea nibbana or you know just because you have a jhana does not mean that you will sort of not be real mm-hmm. you know okay. because even though one does assume that we you don't have hindrances the hindrances work in such a insidious manner where you can't even see the arising of it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. thank you one thing thank you all right um any other questions or anything else that anyone would like to ask before we move on right so page page number 200 and 
262 and page number 263. Now, we don't, do we need to go through these charts because we've already done it, isn't it? Right? <laughs> Everyone jumps up saying, no, no, no charts again. <laughs> Very well. Let us move, do we have time? Yes, we do. Move on to the next chapter. Samuchaya Sangha Vibhaga. The 72, the compendium of categories. The 72 kinds of entities have already been described with their characteristics. Now I will speak of their categories in the ways that are applicable. 72 kinds of entities have already been described with their characteristics. Now I will speak of their categories in the ways that they, in the ways that are applicable. Guide to verse one. The 72 kinds of entities. The four ultimate realities that have been described in the first six chapters can be analyzed into 72 distinct entities, Vatu Dhamma. That is, phenomena which exist with intrinsic natures. That is, phenomena which exist with intrinsic natures. One. Okay. Consciousness, though divided into 89 types, is regarded as one entity because all chittas have the same intrinsic nature, the cognizing of an object, right? So in certain places, you will see consciousness not spoken in 89 or 121, you will see just one. When you see one, please know that it is denoted by the intrinsic nature of consciousness now encompassing 89 or 121 consciousness as one because they all have the intrinsic nature of cognizing the object right cognizing the object do you understand right now because we have come here, now when we refer to the process of cognizing the object, we have the nominative, right? We have the nominative, which cognizes. Then we have the object. We often take, before going there, let's take karma. Then we say in Sinhala, we say, Mage karma akvinnati, right? What we are actually saying is, Mage karma vipake akvinnati, right? So when we refer to consciousness, we might, in certain cases, mistake it for the essence of what has now been gained by the process. Remember that the gained object and the process are two different things, right? The gained object and the process that gains it are two different things. The process is what we refer to as consciousness. Its intrinsic nature, the nature of this energy is to cognize an object. So we must be clear in our understanding and this really comes down to our practice as a meditator, even if you reminisce and think back of your practice, this differentiation between the two is very important. In order to let go of that which we cling to, which is the object, but when we take the object 
or when the object has now been taken as an object by the cognizing process, we often refer to this as now me, myself, and I. That is where the Atma is. When we assume that the process which, in, which is inclined to take the object, now the object which is different from the process is taken, the object itself is taken as Atma. Because Atma is what runs this process. It is because of Atma that this process created the conditions required for rebirth and death and rebirth and death and all of that. So when you are observing the breath or whatnot, the problem which arises in now not being able to observe the breath without controlling the breath is when the view, the understanding that the process and the object are two individual phenomena. The result of this, the result of this process, if we put a plus sign here, plus sign here, the result of this process is knowing the object. Where we then understand what we see or hear or smell or taste or feel. But this understanding or knowing of the object is not Atma. It's the result of a process. The process which takes this object as an object. Do you understand? Right? So the cognizing of the object should never be taken as, for example, as we do just literally with Kama and Kama Vipaka. Right? As Kama and Kama Vipaka. Nowadays, I mean, if a person does not learn the Dhamma or follow it, people often think Kama Vipaka to be uh, Kama to be Kama Vipaka. It's not, isn't it? We know that now. In the same manner, the cognizing process as a verb and the object which, is, which it takes or cognizes are two different things, right? Are two different things. The arahant, the person who understands this is a person who is able to now take the object without essentially classing or taking the object under me, myself, and I. He is able to know the object, but not embrace the object through the tense of me, myself, and I. Okay? Did that make sense? Any questions? Bante, sorry. Yes, yes Bante, sorry again. Sorry, just to ask. So do you mean just Patiga Sampas? That's what you mean? Yes. Yeah, okay, that's it. <laughs> Miri just comes in and says one word. <laughs> and she and she says, okay, this is what it is. Okay, got it. <laughs> Good. So then moving on. So consciousness, you will in certain places see consciousness as one. And when you see one, you must know it's referring to the intrinsic nature of the consciousness, which is to cognize an object. Right, then 52 chase seekers are always taken as 52 chase seekers because 52 chase seekers have their own intrinsic nature. Right, their own intrinsic nature. The 52 chase seekers are viewed each as a distinct ultimate entity since each mental factor has its own individual intrinsic nature, has its own individual intrinsic nature. Any questions there? How does it have its own intrinsic nature? Any questions there? Is that clear? Everyone? No, I'm is it intrinsic functions? 
separate individual functions? Function and yeah. nature is different. Yeah. Right? The nature is that which drives its being as a phenomenon. Okay. The function it, it, is what it does or performs. All right. Okay. Yeah. Right. So here it is. Yes, we could we could say yes. It does have a different function that it performs. Right. The natural. Or I I would say natural functions. So that means it, on its own, rather than somebody else is doing. The thing is this, Damsiri. It's it's vaguely correct. However. Mm -hmm. If we, the problem that arises there is, okay, function. Who performs the function? Mm. The fact is that the phenomena, the, ch the chitta or the, the chitta sikha, yeah. right? it's being itself yeah. is for this. There is nothing before it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Right. So when we say or when we use the word function there, it seems as if there is something before it. But the whole intention of its existence is this intrinsic nature. Just as we would take fire, the function of fire is that it burns. However, the fire is there not to burn. The fire's being causes things to burn, but it's intrinsic, that's its intrinsic compound now performing that function of burning. Yeah. In the same manner with the, with the Cheta Sikha, we refer to it then because of its intrinsic nature. There's nothing before, before it. Okay. Its existence is for this alone. Mm -hmm. Hence, we don't call it a function. We call it an intrinsic nature. And the nature itself is that with like fire, it burns. Yeah, yeah. But is fire there to burn? No. Fire is there because of the components that has brought it together. Whether it burns or not, is another thing. Do you get the point that I'm trying to come to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So hence, Damsiri, we don't call it a function. Function. We call it the intrinsic nature. Nature. Okay. Because then there is no confusion. It is vaguely correct, of course. Yeah. But there is room for um, misunderstanding there to say, okay, what is before that then? Yeah, yeah. Who performs the function? Just yeah. like in the question of what is a consciousness, yeah, yeah. that is where the consciousness is a process itself. What is a yeah. process? The process of cognizing. Mm -hmm. You get it? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So 52 Chetasika are viewed each with a distinct ultimate entity since each, since each mental factor has its own individual intrinsic nature is that clear do i need to explain it anyone do i need to explain it Ante. <clears throat> yes Chamari. um i think it is uh in a way explained where the the pali word is given sabava swabhava yeah. is what we use in singhalese mm. so mehi swabhava yes yeah. Its own intrinsic nature. Yes, yes. So, yeah. Yeah. yes, its essence. It's yes, essence. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Right. So, please, if if you have any misunderstanding as to the difference between a chitta and a chetasika, please clear it out. Yeah. Do not think that they are similar. They are not similar. Right, they're not similar. Okay, so the the eighteen concretely produced material phenomena are, for the same reason, 
each reckoned separately as individual entities and nibbana is known as one single entity so one conscious one chitta uh, 52 chitta seekers 28 rupas and one nibbana all comes down to 72 okay understood everyone okay it is by Monday. Yes. 18, 18 rupees. Ah, 18 rupees. Concretely produced. That. Sorry. 18 rupees. Yes. Right. Not the derived. Concretely produced. Right. 18 rupees. 52, uh, 1, and Nibbana, 1. Right. Although the 10 kinds of non concretely produced matter are expounded under the heading of the ultimate realities, they are not considered to be concretely concrete entities because they lack intrinsic natures and thus do not enter into the range of insight contemplation, right? Again, although the 10 kinds of non-concretely produced matter are expounded under the heading of the ultimate realities, they are not considered to be concrete entities because they lack intrinsic natures and thus do not enter into the range of insight contemplation. Can someone give us an example of non-concretely produced matter and we will take it as an example to explain? Someone give me space. an example. Space. space. Right. So space is a non-concretely produced matter. Right. It's a non-concretely produced matter. So when we take space as a non-concrete, concretely produced matter, Space exists, space exists derived or because of the existence of the concretely produced matter. And in the limitation of space is only known by its limitation itself. Hence, in the contemplation or taking the person as an object, space cannot be taken as an object itself because it can only be known by its limitation. Do you understand? Example, right? Example. Um, okay, my lip bar. <laughs> okay, now let's take this. If this limit, what is the limitation here? The limitation here is what you see around here. Think of this as space and everything else also space, right? If there was no limitation, this cannot be taken as an object. Because there is a limitation, you can now take it as an object. Hence, space itself cannot be taken as an object, but the limitation which is shown can be, is what makes it or what gives it as an element which can be taken, but that is because of the concretely produced, not the non-concretely produced. Do you understand? I feel like you didn't understand that. Bante, then what about this Akasan Chayatane? Akasan Chayatane. You meditate on infinite space. It's the limitation. Remember, in Akasan Chayatane, right, the emptiness, the voidness that comes from when the Nimitta goes missing is shown through the limitation around it. Mm -hmm. yes. Do you understand? It is because of the limitation that Akasana and Chayatana becomes an object or the Akasana becomes an object. Right? Is that clear, Mala? 
Yeah. Anyone else? Does anyone want to give, okay, another derived matter. Let's take another derived matter. I'm non-concretely produced. Someone. Ante, can you try any one of the characteristics of any of the matters? Lahuta muduta kammanyata? Uh, no, the production, continuity, decay, and impermanence, or the okay. Santati, yeah. Okay, so let's take uh, decay. Okay. Decay. When we take decay, decay again just as, for example, with the space, the decay is only visible through the processes that are shown or comes to be of the patavi, apo, tejo, vayo, and that concrete production of that structure. The process is what links or what would show it as decay. The object, hence, becomes the rupa, but not the decay. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. That you wouldn't be able to take it into vipassana then, because you, you, it can't be an object. Yes. The, the jarata itself cannot be an object. Yes, yes. Here, in accordance to the process of the practice, right? In accordance to the process of the practice, the, the, the structure which enables this to be shown mm. is, is not which is taken, I'm sorry, the structure which enables it to be shown is what is taken as the object, not the result. Yeah because the result is not stable and the result is only dependent upon something else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bante, if you take the perception, sensation. What uh, uh, sense, when you refer to sensation, what are you, what are you, what are you referring to as the Rupa? What uh, uh, question? It, it is the body. It is happens, but you can. It, it is. Um, it's you cannot see, you cannot touch, but it does happen. It is concrete, isn't it? Yeah, that's a concrete. The facade. Yeah. yeah. Right. It is. Uh, yeah. So let's just, for the sake of uh, where is the chart on uh, what is the starting of the, the chapter? It's, Bhante, it's on page So in page 236, if we just look at the concrete and non-concrete produced matters, 236, 236, there you go, okay. Mm. Space, bodily vocal intimation, lightness, malleability, buildingness, production, Continuity, decay, permanence. Mm. Now, now, for example, let's take decay again, or let's take example for the, for this, for the purpose of difference. Impermanence through this point and this point, from point A to point B. When seen side by side, you can see the difference. Right, you can see the difference, but in the process of it, you can't see it. Hmm. Yeah, do you understand? In the process, the process is impermanence, is decay, is continuity, is production, 
is lightness, malleability, wilderness, bodily, vocal intimation, space. That process cannot be taken as a vipassana object. This process, when we take it as a concept, which we would usually do because we don't know, right? We take it as a concept. The concept is only visible or even tangible because of the concretely produced. <clears throat> do you understand? So we have to take the concretely produced because that is the only thing that is stable enough for us to take as a vipassana object for the cultivation of insight. Because that is the only thing. If we, for example, use impermanence, we would be essentially, if we are just basing it on impermanence, we would essentially be seeing imaginary visions of what we assume impermanence is. But then how do we now, uh, what, are, what is Satipattana? Chitta Anupasana, Veda Anupasana, Kaya Anupasana, Dhamma Anupasana. Right? The four Anupasanas. Let's take one Anupasana. Vedra Anupasana, because we do it so often. Vedra Anupasana, we see the impermanence rising in the fall of uh, the Vedanas. Yeah. I forgot that. <laughs> yeah. Of the Vedanas. Yeah. Mm. Right? Of the Vedanas. What are the Vedanas? The Vedanas are body sensitivity. If we take body sensitivity, tongue sensitivity, nose sensitivity, ear sensitivity, eye sensitivity. We focus on body. So let's take body now. Now, impermanence of body sensitivity. What do we look at? The body. Do you understand? That's but really clear. Yeah. If we take the body away, mm. now what are we looking at? Yeah. Absolutely nothing. Mm. 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 Right. Yeah. That is what it means. Mm. Right. That is what it means. Because just like, for example, many of you and some of the people who just come for the meditation ask, okay, how what are you supposed to base your attention of? When it comes to the mind, isn't it? Remember, a couple of people asked that question through the months that we've been meditating, right? Now that becomes an issue. That is a real pertinent issue. Because with the breath, we had the tip of the nose or the abdomen or the chest. With the Vedanas, we had the bodily, the help of the body. But where do you base your mind on? Or what is the standpoint by which you observe the mind? Right? It's kind of like the same thing. Because here we don't have something to look at if we can't take it as an object. Almost as if someone would ask, when a person flies, what, on what does he stand on? He doesn't need to stand on anything. He's flying. You know what I mean? I'm just using it as, as a rhetoric, rhetoric example, really. You know, assuming that we need to stand on something to stabilize ourselves. But the fact is, the person is fine. So in the same way, it is not the impermanence that we focus. We base our object of vipassana is the body. It being an object of vipassana, the object of vipassana, the vipassana arises, which is the impermanence. Do you get it? Okay. All right. Which page were we on, please? 365. We were on 264. 264. Beautiful explanation, Bhante. Beautiful explanation, I said. Oh, Mangi, what have you never given me? I got a way, Mamad Balagni, Mukka the Kila, because I can look at him never again, you go and say.
two, six, four, you said, yeah? Yes, and we start on, I will speak of the categories down below in that page. Bottom of that 264 page. All right, two, 264. Although the 10 kinds of non-concrete produced matter are expounded under the heading of the ultimate realities, they are not considered to be concrete entities because they lack intrinsic natures and thus do not enter into the range of inside contemplation. That is clear now, right? I will speak of their categories. Having described the four ultimate realities with their 72 constituents, the author will now show how they are grouped into various categories employed for classification in the Abhidhamma Pitaka. Again, I will speak of their categories. Having described the four ultimate realities with how 72 constituents, the author will now show how they are grouped into the various categories employed for classification in the Abhidhamma Pitaka. Verse two, enumeration of categories. The compendium of categories should be understood as fourfold. The compendium of the unwholesome, the compendium of the mixed category, the compendium of requisites of enlightenment, and the compendium of the whole, right? Compendium of unwholesome. How? First, in the compendium of the unwholesome, there are four taints. The taint of sensual desire, the taint of existence or attachment to existence, the taint of wrong views, the taint of ignorance. In Pali, Chattaru Asava, Kama Asava, Baba Asava, Ditti Asava, and Avijja Asava. Guide to verse three. The word asava means literally that which flows out, that which flows out, asava. In Pali, the word denotes both pus oozing from an abscess and intoxicants which have been fermented for a long time. The defilements classified as taints are called asavas because they are similar to oozing pus and to fermented intoxicants. The commentaries state that the asavas are so-called because they flow right up to the topmost plane of existence or because they flow up to the change of lineage. Go through. Of the four taints, the taint of sensual desire and the taint of existence are both modes of the chetasika greed. Are both modes of the chetasika greed. Directed in the one case to sense pleasure. In the other to continued existence. Do you understand? Karma asava directed towards sense pleasure. The other Baba asava directed towards continued existence. The taint of wrong view is identified as the Chetasika wrong view and the taint of ignorance is a change sticker for delusion moha, right? Is identified as a change sticker of delusion moha. Do you understand? Right? All right. Verse four, floods, ogre. Kama ogre, baba ogre, ditti ogre, abhijja ogre. Four floods, the flood of sensual desire, the flood of existence, the flood of wrong views, the flood of ignorance. Now, asava, ogre, right? 
Asavad, they explained oozing out. Now they are talking about a flood. So you can understand the variance that they are going on. Right? Guide to verse 4 and verse 5. The same defilements that are called taints are also called floods because they sweep beings away from the ocean of exist into the ocean of existence and because they are hard to cross because they are hard to cross they are further called bonds yoga bonds what am i saying bonds not bonds <laughs> right bonds because they yoke beings to suffering and do not allow them to escape. Right? Now, just to put things in perspective, remember the Dhammapada where the Buddha says, he did this to me, she did this to me. One who dwells in this is not one who attains Nibbana. Remember that one? Right now, you find now in many of the instances with many of the things that we have or experience or our human experience must be founded upon. You find you find the ability and the not the ability but the environment for the yogas, for the asavas and ogres to sort of take power. Right, and when they do. The feeling as if, now what happens in a flood? When a flood comes, you don't have control over it. The last thing that you truly have is control. If you're sort of now being carried away by a flood, that is the same sense of what we would feel. That we have no control over that which is happening. Think about in your own life with the hindrances, positions of emotion, where we felt we did not have control. And in most of those positions, you would find the asavas and the ogres sweeping you off your feet and being controlled now by the instance you have found yourself upon, not controlled by the mind or yourself really, but rather the position, the instance that has come about. Now the instance itself is human experience. Who drinks the human drinks? Who swallows the human swallows? Who walks the human walks? Now the walk or the drink or the swallowing is sweeping you away rather than you knowing you are the human who chooses to swallow, to walk, to eat, to drink, to cry. Do you understand? That is a sense of ogre. We have instances where our attention breaks and we realize more. Sorry. Okay. We have positions where our attention breaks and something happens and we become angry. And you realize, oh, I had a moment of, 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 you know, my awareness broke. I became angry. I became frustrated. Unwholesome arose. At that moment, that's an asana. Do you understand? Just like an abscess or a pimple that you choose to break more satisfyingly. <laughs> that is an asana. That asana and the feeling of ogre. Now, the thing that now you, you broke your awareness, now you're angry. You realize that you've now become angry. Ogre, the anger or that position 
takes over. Now you lack control. You lack samvara. Why? Because the mind loses control. Loses control in a way where the hindrance overpowers your action and being. Do you understand? Do you understand? That is a asava and an ogre. Take another. Yes. Uh, Bante, that's me. The level of the level of uh, your um, control of your anger, greed, and delusion. Anusaya, asava, and ogre. It's a level of control. When I would say, when I would say control here, I mean it in this manner, and I should have explained this. The ability to know that it is happening. Do you understand? Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. The ability of recognizing what is happening means you have awareness. Mm -hmm. When you are now unable or, you know, that moment where you feel entirely, absolutely trapped. That, in most cases, is a position where the ogres take control. Yeah. Do you understand? So, Anusaya, Asava, Ogre are different stages? Yes, it's not only really different stages now. When you, if you would say Anusaya, mm -hmm. Asava and Oga, now when you say Anusaya, yes, it's a different level, stages. It's a different level, I would say. Mm -hmm. Rather than a stage, I would say it's a different level, right? Anusaya is like the, the foundation, mm -hmm. right? Anusya is like the foundation, right? The asava is, if he would take something like this, if he would take a hot plate, right? Or a steel plate under which there is a fire, right? The fire confined by the steel plate, the fire is anusya, but you can't see it. Yeah. The steel plate is the asava. Mm -hmm. Right? And if you're boiling water on top of the steel plate, as one would do, yeah. right? that boiling, rolling water is the ogre. Right. So the, actually speaking, it should be ogre, uh, asava, and anusaya through the meditation. So you are controlling, when you come to the level of um, uh, control, that anusaya level, you are uh, you are uh, co completely, um, uh, how can I say, control your emotions? No. Meditative state? No, no, no. Let's stop using that word control. I'm sorry. Let's stop using that word control because you can't control the ogres. You can cut the support for the ogre. Do you understand? Uh -huh. yeah. You can't control a flood. You can stop that which supports the flood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Suppression? Suppress? Mm -hmm. It is all, during meditation, it is suppressed, isn't it? No, 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 no. That would be entirely, that would be fighting with something that you can't fight with. That is where the Buddha says, if you can't control, get up, go to sleep, do something else. Mm -hmm. Right? When what we essentially do in focus and developing samadhi and all of this, we suppress not the ogres. You mm -hmm. can't do that. Yeah. You suppress the conditions that bring about the ogres and the ashrams, okay. which is entirely two different things. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mante? Yes, him. Mante, by, by being uh, sati sampajana, can we stop all these three anusaya, asava, and ogre? ogre? Of course, Nathan. <laughs> so all. Uh, yeah, okay. absolutely. But the thing is, what we cut off is the condition leading to it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Is the condition lead into it? Hey, Chamari, you wanted to say something? Ante, I'm a bit confused where the Anuse is coming in this compendium of unwholesome. I know Anuse is there, but yeah. we are starting with Asava and then into floods and then into bonds. Yes. Well, they don't essentially, the thing is, I think Sriani brought it in terms of in her, in her sort of understanding sort of build. Uh, okay, all right. So it is not that it is essentially mentioned here. Anusya is to, I mean, Anusya is the creating factor of all of these. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Anusya is a condition and these are the results of that condition. I understand. No, I understand. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Anything else? Or, oh, 8.30. Right. <clears throat> Shall we continue the rest next week? Okay. Pushpa? Bhante, when you mentioned, uh, uh, when you mentioned uh, about the Vedana Nupassana, uh, we, uh, we look at the feeling uh, by the man, the base is the manayatana, isn't it? The, do you, is that the base? The base of manayatana. Ma, when we have to, when we have to focus on feelings in Vedana Nupassana, you said the, we have to base ourselves somewhere. So is it the mana ayatana that we have to base on? Why do you say mana? I mean, mana yatana. Why do you, why do you pick mana ayatana? Why not mano dhatu or mano vinyana dhatu? Yeah, I think it's the same term, similar terms. <laughs> What? <laughs> what did you just say? <laughs> Pushpa? <laughs> uh, so, where are we going to base ourselves? Well, when we refer to, right, when we refer to the mana, if you, we base ourselves on the mano dhatu, which is... Mano -dhatu. Which is the experience that comes under all the chakras of the Gana Jiva Kaya. Uh -huh. All of that experience would come under this. However, we can also explain it as an ayatana. Yes. Chakka ayatana, sota ayatana, gahana ayatana, jibha ayatana. We can explain it in that way as well. But we observe through the mano dhatu. Yeah. Right? Right, right. Through the mano dhatu in that position there. Okay? Yeah. In, okay. If we are explaining through the four noble truths, right? Yeah. This is the whole conversation altogether. If we are explaining under the four noble truths, then we would explain under the ayatanas. Right. Right? But we have to, I mean, this is a, we would have to look at it and then see the position of datu and what we experience as datu and what we experience as a ayatana. Right? And what we do experience or what we are relating to changes by the question of what we are trying yeah. to do. So it can be explained in both manners, both ways. Okay? Right. Yeah. Thank you, Bhante. All right. Okay. So let's stop for now. And uh, let's stop for now and continue uh, next, next, next week. Um, on the 1st of November, Bhante, yes. Are we having this?